the whole world was, was made in hate, but another way of saying that the world was made in hate was that the world was made, the time-space cosmos, the world was made to keep you mindless, you know, to, to keep you unaware of the mind. You know, when we get into physicality, that's a way of keeping us mindless. Um, I was just watching a, a clip on YouTube where this man, Ike Allen, made a, a movie on A Course in Miracles and, and I was talking in the movie and then he shows a clip of the brain. Even though I've been teaching for 20, 25 years that the brain is not the mind, and a, I'm talking and, and he brings in a clip of the brain with little sparkly things around it. Or that. I never seen that clip, I just saw it on YouTube. But I thought, no, the world was made to keep us mindless, and then what happens is the ego is this belief in, in lack and scarcity and deprivation, and it gets projected out onto the world and the body. What's a, what's a starting symbol, not really a starting, but just a symbol of, of dependency, but a newborn infant? We don't think of newborn infants as autonomous, unless they're little Siddharthas or whatever, and they're walking along and lotus petals coming below them or something like yeah, that. But for most, you know, a, a newborn infant seems very, very, very dependent on its mother and father for survival. If that newborn infant doesn't have a mother and a father there to, to feed, to nurse, to cuddle, to care for, to wrap up in warm clothes and everything, you know, it's not good for that little baby. It's not going to be good. And then you mentioned the old age one. When, when the body gets very, very old and the, and the things start to break down and it doesn't seem like it can take care of itself, you know, all kinds of things happen and it's another extreme symbol of dependency. So let's look at the middle part. Okay, you go and you're supposed to, you know, baby, you, know, you make it through that and you get up there, then you need to be edu education. Already it's starting to take self-reliance. Like why, what's so important about education? Except to train you to be self-reliant, to wean you away from dependency on your parents. To be self-reliant, to be a good achieving, you know, contributor to the gross national product of the country you're born in and all this and this, you're supposed to become self-reliant. What is that? It's person-reliant. It's body-reliant. Now, now instead of the parents being the ones that have to offer all the love and support and sustenance, now you've got to do it all on your own. Or, hopefully, maybe you get a partner and you can split it, you know? You can split it halfway. Now you've got 50-50, you know, you don't have to buy all those groceries all yourself, pay all that rent all yourself, this and this. Or even a roommate, you know, you see how the ego is like, it's a, I know it's tough, but you've got to still survive. So, you, so the whole thing from beginning to middle to end is dependency. And then what's the way out is, I call it God dependency, intuition, guidance higher self is going to come in and go, this is all a trick. You've never been that dependent little baby. You've never been that autonomous teen, rebellious teen. You've never been in your 20s where you've got to work those early jobs and get that career going. You've never been in midlife crisis where you had the career but you couldn't stand what you're doing so you tried to get out of it, get into another. You've never, and you've never been that old one that's so weak and feeble and time, you know, to somebody to change your diaper and, you know, give you some food or some shots and pills and this and this to keep the body going for a few more days or months or years. You've never been any of that and this higher self, the spirit is telling you, you aren't lacking. It's when you forget that you're a mind, you're a divine mind and you believe you're on the screen that that's where this crazy uh, struggle for fixing things and surviving, and I don't think survival is very fun at all. I, I actually got to a point where I think I was like maybe a teenager and I was contemplating or pondering one day and I thought, I don't like survival. I don't like it. It doesn't feel good. And I don't like to spend my time thinking about what I'm going to be when I grow up, because I don't want to be anything. I really don't. People would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't want to be anything. 
they say that's not an acceptable answer. So then I, they got concerned when I was in high school about my attitude towards this survival thing, and they started sending me to guidance counselors and sending me out on a Rotary Club thing and sending me out on, you know, my mother was a teacher in the school, so they thought, oh, we'll try to hope change his mind a little bit because it's going to be a disaster if he gets to be 18 years old and he still has no ambition <laughs> to do anything in the world. That's, we, we will have failed as a school system. We can't have anybody graduating from our school that has absolutely no ambition and doesn't want to be anything when he grows up. It's, that's, that's worse. It, it'd be better to say you want to be a crook than to say that you want to be nothing. You know, I don't want to be anything when I grow up. So then when I got into university, immediately there was more counselors and more and trying to shape me. So I spent 10 years in university because I really didn't want to be anything. I didn't even want to be a student. I really didn't have, didn't want to play the game. It seemed like a big farce. I could, and then I would, when I would take aptitude tests, my scores would be all over the place. It was almost, now I laugh at it, but for the guidance counselors, they were not laughing. They said, this, the scores, it's just, it's just scattered all over the place. It's like, it's a problem, guidance counselor problem, you know, because he doesn't want to be anything. And then when the course finally came in, you know, in my late 20s, then it was like Jesus was saying, you'll never be anything. And I was like, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, a guidance one counselor, understands. one <laughs> guidance counselor that I could understand, the only guidance counselor I could ever understand. You will never be anything in this world. Don't even try. Well, hallelujah, thank you. What does that mean? Can I take early retirement? Yes. Okay, then I'm, I'm, I'm not going to wait till the body's 55. I'm going to retire at 27. Retire from the thinking of the world. I still wanted to feel joy and extend love, and I was happy to go do whatever that would want, you know, whatever was required of me for that. But as far as making a living, I didn't like the sound of that. They said, you have to make a living. I said, that sounds like pressure. Are you saying I have to survive? Yes, I have to survive. I don't like that. I don't want to play that game. Do I have to? They said, yes. Jesus said, no. So I took that kind of guidance, counseling, you know, and then and that has made all the difference. Two roads diverged in the woods and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I was inspired by that Robert Browning poem. I, I, I didn't know what it was, but I liked the sound of the title of the poem, The Road Less Traveled. I was willing to go down the road less traveled. I was willing to be the outcast, the black sheep. I was willing to be, to take all the projections. As long as in my heart, I knew I wasn't succumbing and compromising to a whole system that I didn't believe in. Like that movie, Injustice for All, where the, the judge is pounding the gavel and telling Al Pacino, you you are out of order. Counselor, you are out of order. And he turns to the judge and says, you're out of order. The whole system is out of order. <laughs> it's a great scene. You know? I remember watching that movie going, yeah. And then at the end of that scene, he comes out and he just sits on the steps of the Justice Center, just pondering, contemplating what is the meaning of it all. We just watched that movie. I said, it's slipping the Course in Miracles book, but he's in that open state of, I don't understand what anything is for. Nothing I see means anything. Then that's when we need, we need to have the, the Spirit come to us and say, all is well. Even though you perceive a meaningless world, it's totally hopeless, you feel like you can't go on and live another day of this lie of compromise, that's okay, because here's the answer. Drop it. <laughs> Drop it all. Drop it immediately. And that's what I heard from Jesus, you know. Drop it, you know. You can drop those thoughts at any instant that you want.
Because they're all different versions of the same one. You know? mm. Anita taking care of herself. Anita wanting to be loved. And you know, you, you can, and Anita in the future. You know, it just, it's just, it's like different spokes on a wheel, but the, the core hub is this idea that, like Carmel was saying, that I'm a person. That's, that's like the hub right there that all the spokes emanate from. You know, and it's interesting, um, you know, Patrice has taken us through the tracing back, you know, so beautifully and, and it's been very encouraging about that and, and I realize that, that whatever resistance I have to, to doing that and to going into the feelings is really ultimately, it feels like it's just a protecting, I just don't want to give up and surrender the I that I think I am. Yeah. Which is the core. There is an Anita. Yeah. It reminds me, I just had a, a flash of an image of a, a, a children book in Belgium and in France. I don't know if it exists here at all, but it was Martine. And it was Martine at the beat. Martine was her dog. Martine was her grandfather. Martine was... And it's like, that's how it is. It's like, Anita. At old age, Anita wants to be loved. Anita wants to be charged. Anita was scared, and it's just mm -hmm. the thing. And when you you see that the core is just oh yeah, I, I put Anita at the center, and I believe it's about her. Mm -hmm. And that's the pain. That's the only pain, truly. Is that there is a center, <laughs> and, and Anita is in the middle of it. Yeah. Thank you. That that. I, I, yeah. It doesn't matter what the story is about. It can be hundreds or thousands of story. The pain is Anita at the center. I see too. The, the whole formula of the world is is all based on externals. Like, like, okay, the parents are the ones that are seen as the responsible ones when when you're a baby and when you're you're young. Then it flips over to the person. And then once you get to the person, I mean, it's, you could start in your teens if you, you know, if you're entrepreneurial, enterprising, you could start making money. There are teens that, that own companies, they're just little genius teens that are very wealthy and they could retire at 15, 16 because they're, they're so much a genius that they own so much already at 15. But the whole st formula goes, you know, Learn to take care of yourself through your own skills, abilities, education, whatever, inheritances, whatever you've got. And then once you reach that point where you can do that, you've got enough of a nest egg, enough of a, of a package to handle all the things that this world can throw at you. You've got just enough to handle it all. Then essentially you can retire from that. It, now you still have to deal with all the emotional baggage and you still have to deal with things breaking down and with all these other things, but you've got a big enough package, hopefully, to deal with all of that. That's the, that's the formula of the world. The world says, get to that point, get to that package as fast as you can, because you have more free time after that. Then you can be autonomously free to spend, spend, spend any way you want, but you've got to have a big enough package, you know, to do that. Then you can just, you know, effectively retire on the world's terms. And you know, and so if your 401k or your, if their pension plan is totally hijacked or taken away, and somebody totally mismanaged it, well then you've got to start over. You've got to do the whole formula back up. You better get back, <laughs> back in the workforce. Build that package back again. Some people like in the ultimate gift, you know, they say I, I had fortunes and lost them, and had fortunes. They go through this cycle. They, they need more excitement and stimulation, so they go through it more than once. But this, what we're saying is that, that that really doesn't work because it doesn't really get down to the root of the identification as being a person and feeling this whole, this emptiness. You know, Hollywood is a place where people do, they can get that package pretty quickly. If they become a famous body and then, then they, a lot of them get depressed, get back on drugs, 
get caught for shoplifting and doing <coughs> things, you know, my God, with a package that big, what are you doing? Shoplifting, you should be, it. what are you doing? That's crazy. You know, what, what kind of mental problems do you got when you're shoplifting? When you, you know, there's, there are things, but still, that you have to start to see, first of all, that the formula is faulty. That the formula itself doesn't really bring what it says it will bring to you. Because if you could see that the formula is really faulty and it doesn't really work, it doesn't bring you into an awareness and experience of what you really want, then you wouldn't put, you would be more like me as a teenager, like, I don't, I don't want to go for, I don't want the package. I, everybody thought it was terrible that I didn't want the package. They said, this, you, you cannot, you're not going to do well on this planet without that package. You've got, you have serious problems if you don't want that package. Very serious problems. Actually, it's been great not having ambition be there. I feel like that, whatever was left, if there's any scraps of it left, I wanted that washed free because I knew that would taint everything that I would experience if I had any bit of that left in me. How could I be in joy and, and not be concerned at all about the ways of the world unless I was really sure that there was another way and it was a way that would actually work. Yeah, and I feel like I keep having the image of, you know, being the center and having all the specifics seemingly story or problem. And what it starts, and it comes back to what we start with, is just you need to be lifted up higher to the awareness of dreaming. Otherwise, as long as you're in the center, it's going to be painful. And it doesn't matter what is the story of the character in the story at the center, because it's going to be painful. Even if it seems that you have millions of dollars and you have everything, at the core of being the character, it is painful. And it needs to just be brought to the awareness of, I am the dreamer of the dream. Because being at the center is actually feeling very lonely. It can be, I remember moments in my life where I could just be in a party with hundreds of people and and friends all over everywhere and I just felt so lonely. I was wondering what I was doing there, what was the purpose of those things, why why was I still taking part of that and and I just felt so lonely and so sad and I couldn't understand why we were doing there, what we were doing there. And I feel it's really that's what it is. As long as I am really invested in the character mm -hmm there will be pain and suffering. That's what the suffering is coming from. It's not in the specifics. Again, it's just the identification to the character. And so, yeah, we need to just take the higher notes, like coming out of the battleground and, and, uh, and realizing we're dreaming. And that's the only way that we can truly start to trust because trusting from the battleground, it's impossible. You cannot trust, because you don't trust yourself. You know, you, somewhere deep down, you know you're lying to yourself. It's unconscious, but it's there. It's like there's a knowing that something's wrong with this, with what's happening. And, and we cannot trust anything, because somewhere we already know we're lying to ourselves and we're manipulating ourselves by making up uh, stories and making up a character that is not even real. And I feel like in my experience, like I, I know it, like I knew it. It's like I, something, I didn't know what, but it was there. I knew that there was something like that. And so trust is impossible at that level. Like you cannot solve the problem at the level of the problem. It's the same thing. You need to go higher. You need to realize that you're the dreamer of the dream and at there, like you have the whole picture from that perspective. It's all a dream. All those characters, all this play is already written. It's already happening. I'm not the one doing it. It's just happening and I'm playing my part in it. And, and from that perspective, then trust is natural. Because you know that it's already all taken care of. And the character will play its part. The miracle shows you that that's, that's why you're, you're using A Course in Miracles, because 
it's it's not so much the book, but wow, we're just we're we're just in the, the miraculous experience. It's like you're clueless and cared for. Things are just happening. It's just it feels so easy. It feels so wonderful, and it's it's a convincing. You know that that experience is what is fulfilling. But without that experience, then it just seems like there's a big hole. There's a lack. Like and, and then you're back to just rearranging the pieces. Like if I tweak a little bit of this in my life, will that make it any better? Tweak a little bit of this. Even psychotherapy, you know, Jesus dictated that psychotherapy pamphlet, but but you know, the therapists of the world are kind of symbols of, you know, they're hired, but they they really it's only the Holy Spirit that wants to teach you that all self concepts are unreal and that you'll never be content in this world until you forgive the world and accept your divine reality. But the therapists of the world can only teach from where they are. And so there's there's some investment in being hired and paid to do what? To fix emotional problems. You know, and if 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 anybody went to a a psychotherapist and instead of the psychotherapist saying, sit down on my couch and tell me about your life and tell me about your parents and da da da, you know, if if the psychotherapist said right from the get-go, you know, the world is unreal, the reason you've come with me is to let go of everything you believe about your personal identity. Sit down on your couch, you'll pay me so much an hour to dismantle everything that you believe about yourself in the world. I don't think that they would, most people would come back for a second appointment. You know, if the, if the psychotherapist was so inspired by the Holy Spirit that they just told it really straight and be like, yeah, I, I, my schedule's busy, I, I'll, I'll catch you later. <laughs> you know, it's like, because that's what's really going on in our lives every day, it's been a, a slow loosening from everything that we believe in, a slow dismantling of seeing we were completely wrong about the whole thing, but it's given to us in little nuggets, <laughs> you know, so, so there's not a complete shattering <laughs> of our self-concept. We get little nuggets, little bits, pieces, so that we, we can slowly feel like our heart's opening, we're feeling. You. I never got to that. You you played the role of the therapist one. I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun for me. It also fell away. Then.